The word pandemic is currently being associated with the global spread and impact of COVID-19, but it was preceded by another pandemic, that of HIV and AIDS, which is still going on. After many decades, there's still no HIV vaccine, but more recently, there have been significant scientific breakthroughs in the fight to prevent infection. Our correspondent Adrian Krish reports from Cape Town. Once a month, Zinchle Mavumbenguana comes to this health center to get a package of PrEP. A daily pill of the pre-exposure prophylaxis protects people from getting HIV when having sex. For my family, generation to generation, it's they do have their HIV positive. So I came here to take PrEP because I, wanna, I don't want to be that part of that generation that is HIV positive. The health center of the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation doubles up as a research site. For many years, residents in the Masipumelele township have been participating in clinical trials. 18-year-old Mavumbenguana is also considering taking part in a clinical trial for prevention options, an injection instead of a daily pill. Recently, we had the breakthrough of a depot injectable that only had to be given every two months. That's Cabotegrava long-acting injectable. And at the moment, in this very vicinity, we are testing a six-monthly prophylactic injectable known as Lenacapavir. So if we can get to a point where young people around the world only have to take an injection every six months, twice a year, that would be an extraordinary breakthrough. Linda Gale Becker is a leading infectious disease specialist, overseeing protocols for several PrEP and HIV vaccine trials. She praises the achievements in the past. In the 90s, hundreds of thousands died of HIV. Now antiretroviral drugs allow patients to live a normal life with a normal lifespan. But the crisis is not solved. Particularly in the global north, there has been a you know, turning away from HIV. I think many people think the pandemic is over. Far from it. We had 4,000 young women became infected with HIV in the last week alone. Uh, we still have 150,000 children newly infected with HIV every year. Uh, there is still a pandemic raging in many parts of the world. It's almost like we've written half the book and, you know, we're walking away before the rest of the, the book is, is finished. Um, and that, to my mind, is a, you know, is, is, is a catastrophe because of all the investment we've had in the last 30 years could be lost if we don't actually finish the story. Zinchle Mavumbenguana wants to play her part in finishing the story. Back at home, the 18-year-old is busy convincing friends to take PrEP. They don't want to take PrEP because they say they don't want to eat a daily pill because they are not sick. I think it's to get people more educated about it. Mavumbenguana says her generation is the first one to openly talk about HIV, an important step to end the pandemic. And Leora Casey has been talking about HIV and trying to end the pandemic for many years. She leads HIV prevention advocacy at Frontline AIDS in Johannesburg, South Africa. Welcome to DW News Africa. Uh, we saw from our report that PrEP in its pill form is already protecting people. How widespread is its use? Um PrEP in the pill form is fairly um, well used, uh, particularly across um, global fund and PEPFAR program, funded programs across Africa. And depending on the country in which, um, in which the people are in, some people are able to access PrEP, oral PrEP, which is the one pill a day in government facilities, um, for example, in South Africa. Um, Part of the uh, element around oral PrEP is that not all countries provide oral PrEP to every single person within the population. They either need to be considered a key or vulnerable population. So the context really does differ depending on the country involved, but it is fairly well used across Africa. Right. And, and now there's this new injectable version of PrEP that lasts for two months. Is that one readily available to everyone? Unfortunately not. Um, the injectable PrEP, uh, there's, there's multiple challenges that some people face in terms of PrEP, such as stigma 
um, should they be caught when using PrEP by a partner or a family member? And they're either labeled as promiscuous or as, um, uh, you know, possibly a sex worker or actually as HIV positive. So the, the injectable PrEP would definitely be a game changer in terms of increasing the number of people who would go on PrEP. But it is not yet available and it is not yet registered in a lot of countries across Africa, despite it being WHO approved. Okay. And we've also heard about the trials of uh, a six-month uh, injectable PrEP. Uh, what do you know about that? And assuming it will work um, if they're running trials... Yeah, I think we've still got quite a long road to go uh, until we get to the point of a six-monthly PrEP. I think, again, um, that would also be a huge game changer in the space of HIV prevention, just because it would really help people be retained on the medication likely, as we have experienced across countries a number of people not wanting to take a pill every day. And you would most likely find groups who would find it easier, obviously, to have a six-monthly injection instead of a two-monthly um, but I do think we're still a, a long way away, a good, good many years away until that is, um, that is, you know, available. I think for now, a lot of our attention and energy is directed to making sure that we get the two monthly prep available uh, in as many countries as possible, funded and out there. And, and which people stand to profit from these new uh, prevention uh, methods? The people that would gain from these prevention methods would be your most vulnerable uh, for HIV. For HIV, So that would include your key population groups, such as sex workers, men who have sex with men, transgender people. Um, in a lot of African countries, we find concentrated epidemics of HIV in these populations. So they would definitely stand to, uh, to benefit. And then equally... In sub-Saharan Africa, there's a huge HIV epidemic amongst adolescent girls and young women. And that would be a really important group that we would need to reach with these prevention technologies to protect them uh, from HIV and equally provide them with a choice um, for oral PrEP or, cabal, uh, or the injectable um, and allow them to choose based on their circumstances. And then you know, in an ideal world, you would also want the general population to have access to, to something like injectable PrEP. Although I do think that we obviously need to start with the most vulnerable populations to HIV in the countries. And one of those groups you've mentioned is women. Uh, there's a, a product on the market specifically aimed at them, uh, this the proven ring. Can you tell us more about that? So the Depivirin ring, I think, will also be a game changer in terms of HIV prevention. Um, so it's it's a, a little ring that, uh, you know, has ARVs and basically is inserted into the vagina um, and protects the woman from HIV infection um, through vaginal sex. It's woman controlled, uh, so she can choose to use it when she wants to. She can self-insert it and it's discreet. Uh, men wouldn't know about it when having sex. And so it really gives a woman a choice to protect herself should she feel unsafe in her intimate relationship or in any other circumstance um, without anyone knowing that she's actually on PrEP. And it protects uh, for 28 days and is then replaced if she wants to continue with PrEP in the next month. So it's definitely, um, I think, a really good tool for young women and girls to use and protect themselves without anyone knowing. You talk about discretion um, and, and stigma around the topic. What would your yeah. advice be to someone who wants to protect themselves but feels uncomfortable about asking? I think I would really try and um, encourage them to assert themselves um, as best as possible uh, to get, gain access to, to you know, life-saving prep, essentially and demand their human rights, it comes down to the fact that it's a human right and um, it's something that they should be given regardless. Although in saying that, I do also recognize that there are huge structural challenges in a lot of countries that stop girls from being all women um, or sex workers, you know, from being able to do that and to assert themselves. And I think um, there's a larger conversation that needs to be had around I'm really trying to address stigma and discrimination within the healthcare setting and within general communities around HIV.
Okay. Leora Casey from Frontline AIDS in Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you so much.